there, Synergizers, and welcome back to another episode of the Creating Synergy podcast. My name is Daniel Franco, and today we have the AFL legend Gavin Wanganine on the show. Gavin is the former AFL player who played for Essendon in the AFL and Port Adelaide in both AFL and SANFL. Gavin won the 1993 Brownlow Medal and has been inducted into the Australian Football Hall of Fame, the highest honour for any AFL football player. He was a two-time AFL Premiership player in 1993 and 2004 and was an SANFL Premiership player in 1990 a John Cale medalist in 2003, and the Port Adelaide captain between 1997 and the year 2000. In addition to this, he was a five-time All-Australian team representative and participated in the National Football Carnival Championship of 1993. On top of this, Wanganeen was awarded the following honours. He was the Michael Tuck medal winner of 1993, the Essendon Team of the Century back pocket, and the champions of Essendon number 19. Port Adelaide have also named the Gavin Wanganeen medal for the best young player, and he's been honoured by having the Eastern Stand of Adelaide Oval named after him, the Gavin Wanganeen Stand. Today, Gavin is an Indigenous Australian activist who is working as a professional artist, painting stories that remind him of his cultural heritage. And in his business career, he was a director of Port Adelaide Football Club, a founder and managing director of Murrah Partners, a recruitment company that does all types of recruitment from blue collar to white collar. And he has a vision to close the gap in corporate Australia. Gavin says, it's an area that is neglected. And so we're playing a leading hand here at Murrah Partners in creating culturally safe workplaces, educating leaders, and creating role models to ensure brilliant Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people have a clear pathway to pursue their dream careers and be mentored along that journey. In this episode, we talked about all things football and business. We chatted about some of his career highlights, to the importance of the team around him, to the importance that his coach, the great Kevin Sheedy, had on his life, the transition from athlete to entrepreneur, to how he and why he became a professional artist, to the work that he's doing at Murrah Partners, the recruitment company, and his passion to change the narrative and change the scenario for all Aboriginal people in the corporate world, to the importance that cultural awareness plays in sport. I know you're absolutely going to love this chat. And if you would love to learn more about some of the other great, amazing leaders that we've had on the Creating Synergy podcast, then be sure to jump on our website at synergyiq.com.au or check us out on the Creating Synergy podcast on all the podcast outlets. Cheers. So welcome back to the Creating Synergy podcast. My name is Daniel Franco and today we have the great one and only Gavin Wanganeen on the show. Thanks for coming on, Gav. Pleasure, mate. Looking forward to it. So it's not every day you um, you get to sit down with a childhood hero. I, mean, was, uh, you were, <laughs> oh, oh, I think thanks, I was mate. about eight or nine years oh, old <laughs> when, you, uh, when you won your, your, your Brownlow in the Premiership in 93 and uh, yeah, followed you on your journey all, all the way Since through. the Bombers days, eh? You've Since followed. the Bombers days, yeah, because I had some mates who, who go for the Bombers. Bom- and ah. and um, so I jumped on. One of them there is the most je- – his name's Paul. He's one of the most jealous human beings <laughs> right now uh, that I'm sitting here. Paul, sitting how here. are you, mate? <laughs> um, so he uh, he's actually thrown me a few questions in here as well that right, we'll, cool. uh, we'll get Probably through. Probably to the Bombers, eh? Oh, it'd be more – Probably, oh, it's just uh, more about leadership or stuff okay, like okay. that. So, cool. Yeah, he's a smart guy, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I just want to start off the the podcast with um, just some career highlights. We do have a large corporate um, following, so they might they all might know who Gavin, they all know who Gavin Wanganin is, but might know not know some of those career highlights. So I'm just going to rattle off some things here. So in 1990, you played your first SNFL game at 16 and you went on to win the SNFL Rookie of the Year that year. Your first game in the AFL at 17, you're a two-time premiership player, one with Essendon and one with Port Adelaide Football Club. 1993 Brownlow medalist, first ever First Nations to ever player to ever win this award. Essendon Team of the Century, Port Adelaide Power inaugural captain, um, the, in one year, you're an AFL 
Players Association most courageous player, the first ever First Nations player to play 300 games. You've got an, the Eastern Stand at Adelaide Oval named after you, the Gavin Wanganeen Stand. There's also the Gavin Wanganeen Medal for the best rookie at Port. Um, you're now an artist with some of your art selling like for some pretty good, pretty good coin as well. A uh, contestant on the uh, TV show Survivor, husband to Pippa and father of six kids, five boys, uh, sorry, five girls and one boy. And on top of this, you're an entrepreneur. You've started waste management, recruitment, coffee business. You know, it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty formidable bit list there. A bit going on there, isn't there? <laughs> and there was a bit that had, yeah, it's gone on. <laughs> There's a definite head wobble the over there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten about all that. <laughs> Who's this person? <laughs> well, congratulations on your career. It's been, um, it's been pretty amazing. If Now, I want to start off. I went on the Wikipedia uh, you type in Gavin Wanganeen, Wikipedia, uh, that's how famous you are. And there's a line on there. It says, Gavin Wanganeen debuted for the club in 1991, round two, in a win against Richmond. He immediately found, he immediately found a niche as an attacking defender. And his handsome appearance <laughs> made him popular with the female supporters. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> that's on Wikipedia. Now, did you edit that yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I did not. But um, look, it does bring back you know a lot of memories in in my early days, you know, in Melbourne and in the, in the big city of Melbourne, and um, playing with the Essendon Bombers, and yeah, just sort of creating a you know a bit of a fanfare type you know situation with yeah. you know supporters with the exciting footy that I was playing and being the you know a Brownlow medalist, at, you know, one of the great clubs in Australia. Um, huge sort of supporter base. Um, yeah, there was a lot of tension on me as a young age, and uh, you know, might have lost a little bit of my good looks, so aging a bit now. But back yeah. then, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, there was a little bit of tension there. So I'm, not, like I'm a, not surprised that's in there. <laughs> Just like a fine wine, mate. You're still looking good. Now we caught up for coffee at Joe's kiosk down at Henley Beach a couple of weeks ago, and. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but you walked into the when you walked into the kiosk, everyone sort of turned their heads. And there was a couple of uh, women sitting next to us who I reckon were sneaking in some photos. Oh, really? <laughs> as, no. as they, do you have? Uh, are you aware of this going on? And 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 how have you sort of managed that throughout your life? I mean, you started playing AFL at seventeen. Mm. Spotlight on early in your years, winning Brownlow's premierships. <laughs> Good looking man, obviously, uh, right? So, ha- how has this? How have you handled the spotlight? Yeah, it's well. I d- yes, I mean, yeah. How do I answer that? It's a tough <laughs> one because, yeah, you you know, I just get used to yeah people. I guess you know uh, having a second look and <laughs> um, and then I realize, oh, that's right. Yeah, I used to play footy for a long time. Yeah. They they recognize me. It's um, it's just something I got used to, and so do you not notice it now, or do you? Do you still notice? it? Oh, I think I notice it's always there. Yeah. It's always uh, it's there. Yeah, um, but I don't really focus on it. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, just just got used to it, and I've learnt not to pick my nose in public because uh, <laughs> there could be a lot of eyes on me. <laughs> it's stuff like that. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, look, it's it, yeah. When, when you're quite young, it's you know, it's nice to sort of yeah. You know, receive that sort of attention or to, to be well known. But as you sort of get older, it's like, well, yeah, it's it's nice. Um, but um, yeah, how, just how, how it is, mate. <laughs> how was it in those early years down at the club? How did you? Uh, how did you? How did you, as a a young up and coming mm. star, handle that popularity? Did did you? I mean, did it affect you in any way, or did you think you you thrived on that and and performed because of it? Yeah, probably in a way. Yeah, it, it sort of pumped me up and mm. um, gave me confidence. And you know, in Victoria and uh, that huge essence supporter base, and then just Victorian sort of um, public life. I guess it was um, yeah, gave me a lot of confidence, and I just sort of rolled with it. Really, it didn't really affect me in any way. I just it, it is what it was, and um, I, I knew I had to. Yeah, I was going to be a role model, and I always wanted to make sure that I gave people my time and was never rude to, to fans always happy to sign the autographs and yeah, it doesn't matter if i'm eating or yeah. with in meat whatever if yeah. people can't you know, I always give them my time so that was something that i focused on and um the, the supporters you know not only for the you know essendon or, or port adelaide or any other t- you know team supporters always gave them my time yeah i think that's important absolutely was probably why you're here sitting with me <laughs> today <laughs> 
So I just want to jump through the years because uh, we, we have got, we are on a time limit here, so we'll go through these questions. Um, I want to jump through the years to the year that you did win the Brownlow, 1993, the same year you won the Premiership with Essendon. It's a pretty good year. Yeah. Is there something that you remember back to that, you know, that almost like turned the switch on in that year? Was there – was in the preseason, did you say to yourself, right, this is going to be the year? Did you as a team – I know you refer to as the baby bombers, all that mm. sort of stuff. So how did you – how did you personally prepare for that season? Yeah, I don't think it was something that we we, we didn't prepare for a premiership. Put it that yeah. way. Yeah, we in 1990, uh, end of 1990, I rocked up at Essendon. Uh, they were licking their wounds, mm. wounds the club because Colony would, would beat them in, in that premiership. Yeah. So 91 was uh, a year where uh, a group of youngsters had been injected uh, into the team. I was one of those. Mm. Uh, like sort of, you know, James Hurd and he was probably yeah, later in that year or early the year after. Um, and then, you know, Mark McCurry, um, David Kelly, you know, these like Dustin Fletchers. The so, you know, we had that young group that was injected in, in which was really important to, mm. to help the, the older guys and the guys who were licking their wounds to sort of take their mind off, you know, what had actually happened. And then we, we progressed forward with a, a new young group that can ignite the older group mm. uh, and, and together become one. So we just got on a bit of a roll really um, – in 90, 91 flowed through quite quickly. I think we made the finals but got knocked out straight away. 92, played some good footy um, uh, but didn't, you know, make the finals. Um, but then 93, so we got some games into those younger guys and 93 just sort of rolled nicely and all of a sudden this young group of players were gelling together, exciting, um, uh, passionate and just young, like mm. just – just wanted to run through walls, you know, yeah. that, that sort of young. And we had talent. Yeah. So we just got on a roll. Somehow we created this small wave and we kept riding. We didn't get off that wave. Yeah. And we, and we just kept riding with it and the wave got bigger and bigger and we kept staying on the wave. And Were you guys big on preparation though? Like was it, you know, all footy clubs are big on preparation but were you putting extra emphasis on it that year and especially yourself? I mean, did you – in in 1992, did you, uh, in your own head, think that you could become a Brownlow medalist the very next year? Oh, look, I always set high goals for myself as an individual. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to aim for the stars. I yeah. did. Yeah. So it was it was always something I wanted to to do. Premierships, you know, all that. Yeah. Um, so you know, you obviously have to put in really good pre season. So your preparation starts in you know November setting the foundations uh, in the running, in the gym, mm. getting your leg strength right so that you're strong enough and your core is right and that you can handle a whole season of football. So it starts in the gym and on the, on the track in summer. So that's the first step. Yeah. And then the second step becomes a bit easier if you get that first step uh, right. So lay the foundation, isn't it? Laying the foundation, laying the brickwork, you know. Um, and then if you throw in a bunch of young lads who are hungry, have talent um, – uh, enthusiastic, uh, we trained hard. Uh, had a good motivator in Kevin Sheedy. Mm. He uh, had the, the the pieces, you know, of the puzzle, and he was able to move the pieces around and give players opportunities to play in positions that excited them. So he wasn't scared to to change things up and get yeah. position players in different positions. Throw a backman into a forward line for a, a quarter. So how he goes, we might be down. And at half time, not playing well, he he mixed things up. Yeah, and he that wasn't was, afraid. He to wasn't try something. Yeah. afraid to 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 change things at half time. And heaps of times at half time of a game, he'd throw me into the center. We we're not getting the book. Gav, you're going into the center. I loved it because <laughs> I wanted to get out of the back line, you know, um, because I wanted to get where the action was. Yeah. So I'd always have a good second half. Um, yeah. So that was happening with lots of different players. So um, yeah, it was exciting to get to get on that wave and. Um, during the the winter in in Melbourne, and as a as a young group, you know, we, we went out a bit, little bit as well yeah. to, so to, you, to bond. Yeah, you, yeah definitely. It, you know, well, it definitely helps, right? When you're becoming a team, you become one. Yeah, definitely. I think it was, um, you know, it was important. We didn't go overboard. I mean, actually, well, there was one player, or two, <laughs> definitely one. I know where he ended up playing the premiership that year. A yeah. guy called Paul Hills, and yeah. I love him to death. But gee, he could party, man. <laughs> like I think he actually went to the Tunnel Nightclub more times than he trained that year. <laughs> And I'm not kidding. Yeah, brilliant. Love your, love your uh, Paul Hills, and, and he <laughs> he played a really good role. And, and 
look, he did burn out yeah. <laughs> quickly. Yeah, it was the, the lifestyle. Both ends, isn't it? Yeah, mm. he burnt it at both ends, and uh, but he got his premiership, and um, yeah, that that bonding all happened with the older guys and the younger guys. Um, there was still obviously discipline there from the older guys and pulling some of the younger guys into line if that needed to happen. Well, yeah, that happened, but everything in moderation. If you get that balance right, I think it's a, that's, that's a good model. Mm. I think we got it right. Did you put a lot of emphasis on? Like, was there a lot of talk from Kevin Sheedy as the coach to do that bonding stuff, and not not so much the partying, but the gelling as a team, becoming one and working together? And, yeah, yeah you know, all, blood on the line, so to speak. Yeah, definitely always. So there, there the odd time where we have a, I think, early in the year in '93 or was the end of '92, we 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 got belted a couple of times. The next morning, it's brekky at. Um, at a certain restaurant, yeah, you know, yeah. seven a.m. Everyone's yeah. there. She, we all have a bit of bonding together. Yeah. That's uniting and, yeah. and getting everyone together when we're hurting mm. to take your mind off what's actually happened. But then he'd reiterate at the end, like, guys, we had a pretty disappointing game, but here are the positives from this game. Mm. Yeah, so always this, stay together. This and this, just bring more of those, yeah. and we'll be fine. Yeah. Don't worry about the rest. Yeah. You know about the rest yourself. It doesn't need to be thrown down your throat. And messing with your psyche, yeah. he, he was always such a positive guy, Sheets. Yeah. He'd always find the positive in the negative and go with that narrative the next week or throughout training. Mm. Focus on that positive. We're going to get better at those positives. We're going to bring that for four quarters. Do you think he was pivotal in your growth and development as a player and a human being? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Probably the most pivotal person, yeah. yeah. Because, you know, at Essendon I, I rocked up as a young Half forward, mid, midfielder, played all my junior footy uh, in the midfield. Um, and I was getting bullied out of the, you know, well, I mean, I was still doing well as a half forward, kicking goals. Yeah. But I was getting smashed physically from the bigger half backs. They were just, yeah. you know, getting into me. So he threw me into the back line. Go down yeah. the other end, Gav, and no one's going to touch it because you're going to be doing the, the minding. Yeah, you're running off. <clears throat> and he said, just play footy. So whenever I got the footy in the back line, just catch me if you can. I'm taking you on. I'm not going to be an old, boring, half-back, back-pocket player just mining an opponent. Yeah. Hang on a minute. No, I'm going to beat you to the football. I'm going to run the ball out of there at a rate of knots. I'm going to fly for my marks. I'm going to flick the handball around. I'm going to run and bounce, bounce, bounce and take it on. Mm. So I, I feel you know, so privileged that he did that because I think that gave me longevity in the game and got my confidence going early. Not saying that I would have, wouldn't have got that if I'd stayed in you know half forward and building into a midfielder because – would have loved to played more midfield. I yeah. think I could have been a, a long term mid, midfielder, yeah. um, and but I always did it um, part time playing yeah. in the midfield. But that just gave me the foundations and the confidence to just take the game on and be who I was. So if Sheeds didn't make that move, um, who knows what would have happened? But it just yeah it gave me the opportunities and the confidence to go forward. So, so that was it. And you know he um, was always there for you as an individual and his players. He always went into bat for his players. Mm. If we ever got you know hurt on the footy field by an, an illegal act or anything like yeah. that, he'd, he'd be looking after you and um, caring and he, he, he wanted to know more about you as an individual away from football as well. So it wasn't all about football, it was about life with yeah. Sheed. So he got the balance right. But he was a great motivator and, and someone who, yeah, who I love and, yeah, he's, he's yeah. great for me. Look, there's, there's some famous coaches in the world, Phil Jackson, Bill Belichick, you know, these sort of guys from the NBA and the NFL – uh, who are renowned to have focused on the one percenters, right? It's all it's all about the one percenters, down to the, like the socks that you wear, right? So it was was Kevin or any of the coaches that you worked with over the years were they really big on the one percenters, like creating those small habits, creating um, those small little routines every day, and just getting better and better and built. Like we talked about before, laying that solid foundation. Yeah, I think. I mean, he he, he was a tough halfback flanker and a talented footballer himself, but he was. A, 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 a guy old school so it was yeah. about toughness and hard yeah, at the okay. footy so that 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 was his one percenters mm, if, yeah. in a way yeah no it, they were no negotiable they were the no, they were the no negotiables it's like you're hard and aggressive at the football mm. it's like you've got to get in there yeah if you don't they will yeah um if you got to run through the contest you got to run through the marking contest if they're in the way it's football yeah they're gonna do it to you yeah. do you want to be nice it's a it's, it's a football a, game a, a but fair yeah. but fair but tough 
that was Sheeds' one percenters. Yeah. And then from there, he had the creativity off the back of that hardness to allow the players to play with flair yeah. and unpredictability. And that's why the 93, the year of the 93, Baby Bombers, we played with flair. Yeah, and no and one could predict what was going on. <laughs> no one could be. And even to this day, that's what wins premierships. You've got yeah. to play creatively and, and, and keep attack, attacking and you're not even that predictable to yourself. So let alone how can the opposition predict what you're going to do? And that's when you got the upper hand. Yeah. After the year of, of like 93, you win the Brownlow Premiership. It's a big year. You step out in the field in 94. Was the pressure on, especially on yourself? Was it? Did you feel an extra weight on your shoulders stepping onto the oval the next year? Only that I'd heard that, yeah, from people or, or in the in the little clips in the paper. They say, well, yeah, the year you got to play like a brown line medalist now. The year after is going to be tough, and the attention is going to be on you. They don't want to be smashing you, and, <laughs> and yeah, that's probably true to yeah, a certain extent. Um, yeah, definitely, it comes with the territory. And um, but I, I feel that my '94 season was actually not far off my '93 season. Yeah, okay. in my own personal opinion, yeah. I think I was reasonably consistent, and I felt I had a really good year in '94. So. Um, I think the pressure was good. I didn't mind pressure. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it was, you know, that comes with the territory. Did you did you use that to fuel you? Did, like the, the pressure of the outside world and the, these all of a sudden these new founded expectations on you, not only you but the team, did you guys use that as fuel to improve and get better? Yeah, look, it was – we obviously didn't have a great year. Yeah. Um, you know, team-wise in 94, we didn't make the finals, I don't think. No. We just missed out. So, um, that probably just goes to show that we took our opportunities uh, the previous year, our, mm. the, the opportunity to the next level. We really just took it. Um, so, we weren't building mm. um, for a premiership. It was more of a blooding yeah. and building further Things down. fell in the right and, place. Yep, yeah, and we just we, – we, we got on that wave. Yeah. And it just goes to show that you can – you can go in and, 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 and achieve things before, um, you know, that um, extended uh, goal, you mm-hmm. know. Like you can actually achieve it earlier Yeah. Um, at times and when things come together, that's where you got to go with it and, and, and strike. Yeah. Um, so that's maybe that's the reason why we, we sort of dropped off quickly because we, we weren't building towards, you know, a three-, four-year pr- premise yeah, plan. Yeah, okay. You were – well, too much team bonding after that. No, <laughs> maybe <laughs> some of the younger guys probably. So it caught up with them, you know. I don't think, uh, yeah, a couple of players sort of dropped off a little bit after. But anyway. But um, that's all right. It yeah. happens, right? Yeah, it does happen. Yeah. And, you know, some of the, the, the younger guys or some players sort of their, um, what do you call it, their, um, their goals sort of change or their passion for their goals mm. change because they've achieved the ultimate. And did, you, did you feel that at all? Did you? I know you said '94 was a great, a better year from you as a player. You personally, yeah. you felt like you performed. Did you? Now that you were a Brownlow medalist and um, and a Premiership player at a very young age, you know you've almost achieved everything what everyone sets out to achieve mm-hmm. in their football career so early. Did that change or affect your mentality in any way, shape, or form? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, sometimes if you achieve something special, like premiership or anything life so early in your mm. career, yeah, maybe the, the hunger uh, sort of tapers off a little bit because yeah. of that fact. And I think that's human nature. Yeah. But it's you got to learn from that. And if you get an opportunity to play in a premiership later, which for me I was, I was very lucky. Yeah. I got one at 30 years of age, so, yeah. so 10 years later. Yeah. So it was a long time in between drinks. Mm. But, um, you know, you got older players who might be just tapering off, you know, from – they're already off their peak if they're in, you know, 30, 31. Yeah. They're just in that – just back into that, their peak and they're yeah. playing an experience, but it's a quick fall off, off the cliff the Straight next year. So it, yeah. those older players can drop off very quickly. Yeah. So, you know, the, the shift in, in the right balance is out. So you need that right balance of players in the right age brackets to win a premiership. Yeah. So you um, – in 97 were – Poached almost <laughs> from the from the hands of uh, of Kevin Sheedy, <laughs> the the Port Power team knocked on your door and said, "Come over and let's uh, we need you as captain." Were you ready for the captainship role in that? Okay, I, I think um, yeah. Look, being a South Australian, yeah, Port um, approached me and 
pretty hard. And, you know, yep. does that draw to go back home, I guess? If yep. I hadn't have won a premiership with Essendon and had the success that I had at Essendon, I wouldn't have come. Mm. I felt in a way that I, I've achieved so much at mm. Essendon. And, um, that's probably what got them over the line. Yeah. If I'd won, I hadn't won a premiership or had the success, I would never would have come back. Yeah, okay. Because you wanted to achieve I wanted to achieve at, 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 a, at Essendon. Yeah. And I did that, so that helped. And, yeah, the decision was made. And it was never an easy uh, decision, though. I, I had a great career at Essendon. Yeah. Um, Were you in the leadership team at the time? Sorry, I should have no. probably. No, you weren't. No. So no. going into Just a role. a young fellow, yeah. Yeah, so going well, into a role at Port. I still, I mean, I was, yeah, I wasn't in any leadership role. Yeah. I mean, I had Bomber Thompson and, and these likes of the ladies at Essendon. Yeah. So. Um, but it, it was, yeah, thrown upon me, I guess, in a way. Uh, I played the most games, yeah. over, easily over 100 games yeah. already. Were you uh, ready 100, for 120. Well, are you ever ready? I mean, no, look, I mean, not. <laughs> it's always, you, you, for me, I, 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 I thought I'd go in and play a lead by example yeah. and just play hard, tough, aggressive footy. Yeah. My strengths were one-on-one -on -one relationships with players. Yeah. Which I think is the most important part yeah. of your leadership is Absolutely. what your relationship is uh, like with the team, and especially one on one, and you treat them uh, on their own merits. Whether mm -hmm. they're younger lad, you got to try and communicate in the way that they they can receive that sort of communication. Then you get middle aged players, and the older players have different communication mm -hmm. again. So I felt that went really well. Mm -hmm. uh, always gave the younger players time and welcomed them in and, and spoke to them. And wasn't sort of the guy that was going to be ranting Ravi overly over the top. It's like, mm. this is how we do it, guys, um, and played as well as I can. I uh, felt I did a pretty good job of that. But four years I did that and yeah. I had a lot of injuries in those first four years. Yeah. Just on and off. I start playing a good patch of footy, get an injury, you know, yeah. and that was my first four years. Could have been doing the simple fact that you just threw yourself at anything. Yeah, you, still, <laughs> you still had that Kevin Sheedy mentality. Yeah, like I threw myself in a lot and I'm paying for it now. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah, it was a good experience. And, well, um, I think you won the most you, – well, you did win the AFL's most courageous player, like voted by the players. Yeah. There, there's something in that. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, people look at the likes of, you know, Patrick Dangerfield and that today mm. just throws mm. himself at the yeah. ball. Yeah. You, you, you're almost going <laughs> to be certain that he's going to pay for that. Yeah, he'll on. pay for it. <laughs> I am now. Thank yeah. You. In what way? In, in your body's just – Yeah, you just – you know, you – your back, your yeah. shoulders, just so sore. You, you know, it's hard to sleep at night because you can't lay on this shoulder yeah, or that really. shoulder. It's like it's numb when you get up. It's aching. Your yeah, feet wow. are sore. Like when I get up, I can barely walk sort of thing. Like it takes me 20 steps to warm up. It's like, yeah, oh. wow. I feel so, like an old man. Yeah. Getting up out of bed. Yeah, but it warms up all right. But yeah. In a way, I guess I'm you know, reasonably lucky in a way as well that I didn't have any you know, serious, serious, serious injuries, bro. but it's more wear and tear. I feel like I've... I've what was um, what were some of the key learnings you reckon you learnt in those early years as Port's captain in a new club? Was there anything sort of pivotal that you took away from or, that period? Yeah, from that period. It was that the very first year it was Port Adelaide Power. It was a new era, mm. and that was tough to lead a new brand, a new new brand. Um, players from all over Australia had come in. Yeah. Um, a lot of Victorian boys and it was going to be tough. It was going to be hard yards. Well, I mean, most captains when they step into a role, right, You, they've been – the players have kind of been playing together for some time whereas this was completely different. You've, you've basically asked to assemble a new team and, and lead a team that's never played together before. Yeah. How did you, how did you manage that as a, as a leader and, and also as a human being? Well, we had Jack Cale. He was good yeah. at, at motivating yeah. and um, encouraging young young fellas uh, and new players to just have fun and, and and be confident in themselves and have a crack and don't be scared of the situation mm. or just embrace it and 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 nothing's impossible. Um, you know, in that first year, I think the Power won ten was it ten games, yeah, ten yeah. and a half games, miss out finals on percentage. That's unheard of. No, yeah. no, no new team will come no. in and win ten games in their first year. So we obviously. Did something right, and it probably comes back down to you know a lot of that with Jack Cale, just encouraging the players to not be scared and 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 just roll with it and be confident and um, 
you can go on and achieve things, you know, quicker than you you would expect. But we were don't get it, don't get me wrong, we were a new side. Yeah, we were in. Okay, we weren't the old Port Adelaide Magpies of old. Mm. We were Port Adelaide of new. Yeah, and we were. It was a, you know, there were games where we got smashed. Mm. And the second year was 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 tough, and the mm. third year, it just goes to show that we didn't have a, a, the foundation. Mm. We sort of bobbed up and played above ourselves in a way for yeah. a new team. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was it was hard hard work and tough going for those first, you know, especially the second or third, and I think maybe even the fourth year, where it just goes to show a new club or a new uh, team that's been assembled together. It, you, you haven't got that tradition, yeah, and and those pillars in place. Mm. Whilst they were there in the Magpies era, mm. they were there. They were a great club, but we were the new Port yeah. Adelaide Power team Correct. in the AFL and a new. National competition, not in their Senate Fair anymore. Yeah. So it was, um, yeah, it was it was tough times it would have been. from time to time. How did you manage the, I guess the, the transition from a leader who you loved and adored in Kevin Sheedy to a new coach in a new team? Did did you were you almost comparing? Was there a point of view where you're saying mm, you're not so much like Kevin, or were you just really impressed with? And I'm not after a scoop, but you know, were you really impressed with Jack's um, ability to, to pull the team together? Yeah, you know, I was impressed with Jack's ability to pull a team together. He mm. he was um, a, a great leader, a great coach. Mm. I mean, he's a ten time premiership uh, yeah. SNFL premiership coach. Yeah, so he knew how to get guys together mm. and to play. Um, play football and, and to be successful. He he knew how to do that mm. um, just because it was at the highest level now in the AFL in a national competition. I, I don't think you know, that mattered. That mattered. Mm. Um, he did as well as he could have done with a, a, with a young, extremely young, in, uh, immature, inexperienced group. Mm. Great motivator, Jack. Great motivator yeah. as well. Yeah. So um, he, he, he knew his stuff and he had the ability, especially, you know, Look back at this in a fail because of how you compare him. He was one. Of the, he was probably the greatest coach. I mean, mm. ten premierships. Yeah. And he had a, a wonderful ability to speak to the players that are middle of the road players and even the on the fringe players, mm. which is a half your team maybe yeah. or yeah. a quarter of your team. Yeah, you got all your settled stars and your middle group that are solid workhorses. Then you got that batch of players that are, you know, hanging the team. They're playing reasonably. Good reasonable football, and then you guys who are coming in and out. He had an ability to get those guys to play much better than the ability they had. Yeah, and that was the way he spoke to them. Yeah, he gave them the confidence to go and play above their own ability, and that was one of his greatest strengths. Because you get those players playing good footy, it helps the rest of the team. You yeah. become a great team because of those because of that that group of yeah, players yeah. who are not recognised. You're only they can go you. they can go and do their job. They're the workhorses. He yeah. can get them to play unbelievable footy. And they're, they're the workhorse type players and you need them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Was there any – while we're just chatting about the coaches, was there anything that – because you've played under three in the AFL. Yeah, Choco Williams. Yeah. Choco as well. Did Was there anything that over your career that you look back now that you think to yourself, well, that was pivotal? Uh, what they said to me that day – what I learned from them in their application, whatever it might be, that was pivotal to who I am and where I am today. <laughs> yeah, gee, that's a, <laughs> it's a big, it's yeah, a big question. That's a, that's a hard one to answer, I must admit. I mean, I think I – look, I spent a long time with Kevin Sheedy. I think I've, I've spoken about, you know, the way he coaches mm. and that connection and the motivating type that he is. I think I think Choco's similar in a way. Yeah. Um, and, and same too with Jack, a great motivator. They all have their strengths and – um, and similarities, and Mark Williams spent a bit of time at Essendon mm. um, back in I think it was was it ninety three and ninety four. He was assistant coach at Essendon, yep. um, so I spent a bit of time with Choco there. He he's a great motivator, and Choco gave me an opportunity to play in the midfield for a whole year at mm. the end of one preseason. He uh, I think I was twenty nine, mm. and Choco came up to me and said, "Gav, I know you you know you need to get in the midfield and do some damage." <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna release you yeah. next year. You can play in the midfield the whole year. And I go, you beauty, <laughs> bloody yeah. beauty. 
And I you know, had one of my great years the following year. Yeah. So that was the innovative, you know, mindset and of Choco yeah, to, to identify and see that, that I needed to be released. Yeah. I got to play one full year in, in that, only my only year mm. to be play, to play in the midfield for the whole year. Was that a frustration for you throughout your career? Look, to be honest with you, if I look back on it, I think I, I, I could have been a great midfielder as well. Yeah. Well, you were though. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I had, yeah. Uh, well, when I went in, I always, because I didn't get in there as much. Yeah. Right. It's a bit like, I had to explain it. I don't know. Well, for me, it was like, you know, I love playing in defence, you know, yeah. but I've always played creative, attacking footy. And I can do a hard lockdown role as yeah. well, you know. It doesn't matter what role you got in life or what job you got. Sometimes you get locked down and then other yeah. times you got to be creative. Yeah. But you've got to get that balance right. Um, and the courageous ones will be very creative the whole time and, and, and pull a lot of ma- amazing things off on the footy field or in, in business. Mm. It's it's no different. What, what, what industry are you in? Um, but a lot of the time I, I didn't. Want to just do the shutdown? It's like mm. it's it's like yeah. it's like whole, having a cheetah in a in a backyard <laughs> chasing the rabbits around. Yeah, you need to open them into you, a paddock. You need five. You know, they need ten k's yeah. to chase that chase things down. It's in the instincts. Yeah. And that that's for me. I I I want, yeah. Looking back on it, I would have loved to have yeah played more, more midfield. But I'm not. I don't, I don't regret it. Did you speak up though? Did you? I probably you, didn't. No, I probably. That's the thing. That's one thing I. You didn't. Open probably wasn't bullish enough about yeah. it. Yeah, and that's that's something that I, I don't regret it as well. I don't regret it either. Yeah. But looking back at me, if I had my time again, if I, it's always the case. If I knew back then what I know now, yeah, correct. That's that's always the case. Yeah. But because um, you would have thought from an outsider peeking, you know, peeking through, I would have thought Gav would have been there saying, "I can get me in the midfield." Like, what you, like almost demanding where you played in a sense, but you were just doing the team thing. I was probably doing the team thing, and it was important for our team that we had, you know, someone or, or some more than just one. Or a lot of time, it was someone who could win the ball in your defensive mm. fifty, who was always going to better win that fifty-fifty and get it out of there and, mm. and do a job. It just it's like an ace up your sleeve that you just you, you know you just keep playing the ace back down there yeah. or you're going to put the ace in the middle. It's just one of those situations. It's, you know, yeah, it's just absolutely. how it was, man. But anyway, yeah. um, I, I cherish that one year that yeah. I had, <laughs> out of the 16 that I had. In the so lessons field. learned from this would be speak up if you want something, right? Or, or Well, you've got to better back it up. Yeah. If you want that's to speak true. up, that's the thing. I, I, knew I could back it up, yeah. but I didn't use that. Mm. Um, so, But that's just one of those things. I don't regret it. Mm. But if I had my time again, I probably would have said, right, yeah. I'm playing in the midfield. Yeah. Um, I'll show you why. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to jump into – we're going to have a little bit of fun with you here. And it's, uh, I, I generally do – I do a lot of research um, on – before podcasts and um, there's so many articles, so many um, interviews, so many video highlights with wow. you, right? So – and there's only – and I always try to find something that, you know, you probably haven't spoken about before. So I thought I'll skip all the, um, I'll skip all the interviews and, and YouTube searches and, and whatever it is. And I'll go, some, I'll go to some of, the old, some of your old football mates that you used to play with out at the Power in the early days. <laughs> so there's a guy by the name, he didn't want me to throw his name under the bus, but I'm going <laughs> to. So Sean Burgoyne told me a couple of stories and I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just, so I want to set a scene. In pre-season one year, you guys used to ride up to the Norton Summit, right? It was part of your, do you remember getting on the bikes and riding up to the Norton Summit? I know Summit? where you're coming from, <laughs> from on this one. And this is, <laughs> let me, this is highly <laughs> exaggerated. I know exactly what, I'm going to let you say it. I'm going to let you say it, but I know what it is and uh, they were wrong. It was, uh, it was let me, let me, slightly let, exaggerated. Let me, Go let for me, it. <laughs> Let me jump in. So if anyone who lives in Adelaide, if you're right up to the Norton Summit, it's a, it's quite a tough ride. It's a big, big steep. It might hit, have been Shepherd's Hill. Oh, Shepherd's Hill, yeah. Up so, at Flinders. Yeah, so you, you hit a fork in the road and then there's a track that goes left and then there's a track that goes right. Is that correct? And there's on the left, there's a really – I think it was pretty – I think it was Norton. Maybe summer. it was Norton. It Maybe was Norton Summit, thing. yeah. It was Norton. So – yeah, because we actually got the map out. <laughs> in our conversation anyway so 
On the left is this really steep, it's shorter distance, but it's much steeper. And on the right, it's a longer, it's much longer, but a lot more, a lot, a lot more. <laughs> oh, this is another story. This is another one. There's, there's so many stories. I know this one. <laughs> All right. So apparently the team used to always go to the left, right? Up the steep hill because they thought it's shorter. It's much less time. We'll just go through a bit of the pain and get through. But apparently Gavin always used to go to the right. The longer distance, the more flatter it was but you were always up the top first <laughs> and so is there any truth and sean wanted me to ask this is there any truth in the rumor that you had a mate there waiting for you in the car <laughs> where you would chuck where you would chuck your bike in and get him to drive you up to the top is there any truth in that rumor yeah yeah <laughs> it wasn't every time it was the odd time uh brilliant no nah, that was yeah is there a reason you just didn't want to do it couldn't be bothered couldn't be asked. Oh, my butt was hurting the whole time, <laughs> riding up the hill. And, like, mate, you know the chafing you get in the blisters? I'm not copping that. I'm going to get my mate. He'd bring up the trailer, put the bike in and uh, take me to the top. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, you're not going to hear the, You're not going to hear the end of that. So that's one. All right. I've got a few a few here. So the, the second one was uh, back in the days when the Nokia 5110s uh, were about. Do you remember the Nokia mm. phones? They yep. had the little antennas on top. Yep. yep. So Sean said to me, he reckons you had sort of this bit of fear about cancer at the time and the, some of the radio waves. He, he, he said that uh, Gavin used to believe that when you're on the phone, the radio waves would travel through your head and, and, and then into the tumors. Phone. Tumors. Tumors. Yeah. It would be <laughs> more technical. So that they can create tumors, guys. <laughs> you can fry your brain jet, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so. <laughs> What I'm led to believe is that you put tin foil on the antenna, so that, and then and then complain that you didn't get any reception when uh, when you were on your phone. Is there any truth to that rumor? Oh, that might have been exaggerated. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm not saying either way, but uh, I don't think I put. He, he, there was this little moment he said that you used to put tin foil on uh, on the antenna, so you wouldn't get. If I did, I might, I might be ahead of the time, though, because <laughs> look what everyone's Absol- doing now. Absolutely. <laughs> Well done. Um, and the last one that he brought up, which uh, which we had a bit of a laugh about, was I think it was after you, you injured your ankle. One was this preseason running? Yeah, preseason running. <laughs> <laughs> the two point two time trial, the run that we did every single year. Every single year, he reckons there was one year you were complaining about your ankle. He said, if I do this two point two um, <laughs> two point two kilometer time trial, my ankle's going to blow up. And I, don't, I can't remember the name of the coach, but one of the coaches at the time said, well, if you're not going to do the 2.2 time trial, then you're going to have to do 10 minutes of fart leg training, to which you agreed, right? And Sean would say, in Gavin's logic, he would agree to the 10-minute thing, but yet the 2.2 time trial only took eight minutes. So, in fact, you're actually doing two minutes more <laughs> exercise. Is there any truth to that? So, yeah, there's big truth. So, what <laughs> happened was, so, you had an old ankle injury that I, when I came over from Essen that I had with me. And um, it needed to be managed and looked after. And they do that 2.2 time trial on the hard surface, right, yeah. at the uni oh, yeah. loop. So it's yeah, on the hard the surface. Right. So, you know, if you're pounding on a, on a joint, yeah. f- uh, you know, running at a pretty good pace for, you know, for a 2.2, you try and go, you're going to get issues. So anyway, I did it once. Yeah. I did it once and it blew up the next day. And then when it came – and we used to do that probably – you know, two or three times to so you can improve your, your yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next time it came and we all lined up to do it and, and I said, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I don't care what uh, – no. I'm not doing it. I'll run on the grass. I'll do whatever on the grass, but I'm not running on hard surfaces no, ever no. again. So don't ask me again. Yeah. No worries, Gav. Yep. Okay, cool. So I just – when they did the time trial on, on the outside, yeah. I did some – yeah, I did some fart leg on yeah. the grass. But yeah. think, it might have been a bit longer, but it's fart leg. So yeah, you sprint. No. You jog, you walk. So there's less pounding. And yeah, correct. It I know exactly where yeah, you're coming from. It didn't from. stir up my joints. So <laughs> anyway, so I, every time I'd rock up, I'm on the inside there on the outside. I'd look at them running along on the on the, on the the grass, nice happy, and happy. happy. Day, happy and they're stressing, stressing out trying to run a personal best every time. <laughs> Looking over at me. Oh, the lucky bastard. <laughs> so you, uh, you came out in front in the end. What was the Shepherd's Hill one that you're going to talk about? Uh, Can you bring that up? Yeah, well, I could, well, it's a bit of a funny story. The, Shane Bond, who used to play at the Power, yeah. you know, they, we were riding up Shepherd's Hill Road, yeah. um, up the hill, and we'd come from Port Adelaide, out of harbour, yeah. all the way up to Flinders, yeah. you know, 
what's that, 10K or something? Yeah. And then we had to go up the Shepherd's Hill. And I was pretty knackered when I got to the <laughs> hill, right? And um, so anyway, Sh- Shane caught me as we got up, started going up the hill because the hill, I was hurting and I was yeah. just cruising. And so he went past me. Yeah. And then he went past this old lady. She would have been about 68, 69. And she, it wasn't a mountain bike or a racing bike. It was one of those old lady bikes and it had like a little basket on the front <laughs> and her wheels are, you know, hand, hand, handlebars out here, you know, one of those bikes, <laughs> yes. like one of those old ladies yeah. and they put their groceries yeah, in know. there. Yeah. Anyway, so Shane passed um, <laughs> this old lady yeah. and he kept going up and then I had a bit of caught up to this old lady, just caught up to, and then I had a bit of a, a chain problem with my <laughs> chain. So I had to pull over on the side. So I'd, I actually, t- I, sorry, I overtook the lady, yeah. right, and started getting closer to Shane. Then, but he was probably, I don't know, five, six hundred metres ahead and it was a bit windy. <laughs> and then I had a chain problem, pulled over, fixed the chain. And by that time, the old lady had overtook me. <laughs> anyway, she ended up beating me up the top of the hill, <laughs> right, because I had a chain problem. And Shane's up the top of the hill waiting for me. And he's looking for me, looking down there. And you can see this old lady coming and he's thinking, what? <laughs> You lazy beat? bastard, Gav. You let that old lady, 70-year-old, beat you. Uh, that's that's his um, claim to fame, that Brilliant. story. That he, an old 70-year-old lady beat me up Shepherd's yeah. Hill Road. Is there, is, so it was a definite chain. Problem. Well, <laughs> he's not you, lying. It, she beat me, <laughs> but she didn't beat me on ability. <laughs> she beat me because my chain uh, stuffed okay. up and it came off and it kept coming it's off. It's a story you're sticking to, is it? The chain? No, it's <laughs> legit. That's legit, but he's bloody put that big twist on it anyway. No, nah, very good. <laughs> Look, if there was some, uh, we also talked about some good as well. So Sean did bring up, he said, I asked him the question, what was one thing about Gavin that made him, you know, a great, the great player that he was? And he just said it was, if there's one thing that he could pick on or pick up on, um, it was your ability to read the play, right? It was your ability to be in the right position at the right time um, and be able to just really understand and strategically understand where the ball was moving before anyone else <laughs> did. Do you, that, that I've always sort of taken that, the, um, the reading of the play as, as a way of life, right? If you have the ability to read the play, not only in sport, but in, in life, mm. and strategically look a few steps ahead, it, it you know, had some real value. Given your success, do you think that's something that you learned to read the play or were you just naturally given that ability to really understand where you needed to be? I think you learn to read the play. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a little bit of it's instinctive, a lot of it, but I think it's just patterns yeah. and stuff that you study in, in, in watching games and the more you do it, the better you get at it. Mm. And, yeah, I, was, I, was, I, I read the play quickly, faster than a lot of people. Did you spend a lot of time honing in on that skill in your career? Just by playing. The more you play, yeah. the better you Experience get. Experience. And, and you just really um, tap into, you know, uh, other players are reading it too, but you just got to read it a fraction faster. Yeah. And by doing it a lot, you get better at it. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I think, yeah, he's just spot on. He's spot on there. I, I got the spots because I yeah. knew where it was going. I could read it and feel it. And um, it's percentages as well in a way. I mean, if, you want, you need to, if you're good at crumbing the footy, well, I think 80% of the time the, 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 the crumb is going to come to the front or yeah. slightly to the side. That's 90%, or well, 80, 90, something yeah. ridiculously so high. And then that's the timing thing. You can't get there too early. Mm. Because it could get full over, yeah, or, yeah. or, or too close, the crumb could go over your head. Yeah. So it's about the timing and the distance as well. Mm. So you just got to be good at it, mm. you know. Um, but yeah, he's probably right. Yeah, I was a good reader. <laughs> Do you reckon that tells you in good stead over your life? The, your ability to, like, just through your business career, you got a few entrepreneurship opportunities um, coming along. I think it may be a little bit different because yeah. it's a different kettle of fish being yeah. out in the real world, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll find out because I'm, I'm just I'm just start, <laughs> you're, starting. You're to, on, I'm just getting started on some of my business stuff. Journey. So, I'll, yeah, probably got to learn reading the play in lots of different areas. Yeah, going forward. The one thing that we did speak about last time, and I just wanted to touch on it really quickly because I thought it was powerful when we spoke about. It. So, in 1995, in the Anzac Day game, Michael Long stood up to mm. a player. I won't mention any yeah. names. Yep. Um, and it was a, he stood up for the basis of, of racial abuse on on the Oval at that time. Mm. Now, you, you said that Michael to, was a long, was like a mentor to you. Yep, yep. How powerful was that moment to you in your career? Yeah, it was, um, it was amazing because, you know, M- Michael took me under his wing when I went to Essendon. I watched him play for Essendon uh, as a youngster um, at the MCG and to have him there support me 
as a young Indigenous kid, you know, coming over from Adelaide. Mm. Uh, and then to see him, you know, stand up because a lot of Indigenous players and, um, and a lot of people from, you know, from different races, you know, um, but, but especially, you know, the Indigenous boys were, were copying racism and mm. called, you know, these names the whole time. And for me, I actually got called names at the MCG on two occasions. For me, being a light-skinned Aboriginal person, mm. you know, I never really got it as a kid because um, a lot of people didn't know I was Aboriginal. Um, mm. And I'd go into bat for my cousins who, mm. who were racially abused the whole time were called names. So I'd be protecting them and all of a sudden, you know, I got called yeah, so-and-so at the MCG by opposition players, you yeah. know. Um, you know, so that really shocked me to, mm. to see that was happening. But I wasn't surprised, I guess, because it, uh, it was happening. And then Michael Long, who obviously would have been copying it for quite a few years, you know, earlier, um, he stood up. And said enough is enough. So he, he went, you know, went to the media and went to the AFL and said this needs to stop. Mm. This is what happened. I'm not putting up with it. And it, 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 you know, it forced the AFL to come up with you know the racial vilification code, mm. which is a rule that's been around now for many years. Mm. And and racism on the football field in the AFL, you know, towards any race or religion, uh, was created and, and started because of Michael Long, mm. the great Michael Long, who's been a pioneer. And then obviously Nicky Wimar yeah. um, with, with his stuff, but Michael actually was the one who went to the AFL and and, and, and created that that wonderful change. We've just got to deal with it now in the in the stand. Yeah. We've just got to get a rule in the yeah. stand for people now because, you know, the odd person, you know, it's a minority of people, but um, that minority can stand out and people can jump on the back of that and it just it's something that we as a nation are still building towards um, trying to, to stamp it out, but at least the AFL on the football field, it's pretty much gone, Yeah, which is what's amazing. What was it like in the weeks uh, after, you know, Michael come out? Was it – did you notice some change straight away or what, what did you – did you notice any tra- – uh, did you notice any trends change from the players from that point on mm-hmm. or was it a longer-term thing? No, you could sense that this is not going to be tolerated anymore yeah. and that this is a big thing. Yeah. You could sense it yeah. in the air yeah. right across the, the, the AFL. That's um, good. And the AFL did a great job, amazing yeah. job to create that uh, that rule, uh, the, the racial vilification rule, um, which um, a lot of players uh, benefit from now from all races. Absolutely. That no one can be um, – Well, it's just not good enough. It's it, just really? not good enough. As yeah. people, it's – this day and age, it's not – It's not. it shouldn't be accepted, you know. And not, yeah. Um, it's lucky enough in in the football field, but out in the you know community where, where, when it does happen, um, I think it's everyone's responsibility mm. to um, to jump on board and um, yeah yeah call, call it out to the, the best way they can without you know creating any more issues. You know there's a, there's a way to do it, um, but uh, you know uh, everyone if it, we're we're solid in um, you know looking after that, I think we'll go a long way. So Michael, you said was your mentor almost when you came into the to the role. Did you pay that forward in the sense that when you went to Port or when, or this, uh, when or, um, any of the other young juniors came through, you almost took them under your wing and did the same thing for yeah, them? Yeah, well, you know, Peter Bergen was a young fella. Yeah. You know, he was 17, 18 mm. uh, coming in. Yeah, I took him under my wing a bit and yeah. encouraged him to play his brand of footy. Be mm. exciting, brother. Yeah. Don't hold back. Yeah. You take them on. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That just comes naturally then to, you know. Because you're related to the Burgoyne. Yeah, 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 yeah. Our families are from the same from the area. Gugatha. Gugatha. Yeah, yeah. Over on the West Coast of the Australian. I've got Narunga heritage in me as well. Um, and then, you know, even other younger players. I mean, like a guy like Bowen Lockwood. I mean, no yeah. one probably even remember. Um, who was I do like, remember. From he Victoria. Was, he, he was a tool. Gun. He, he was, was going to be touted as the next best yeah, thing. But yeah, but unfortunately he hurt his back. Injuries, yeah. So, I, you know. Encourage him and other younger players who had the talent. I would don't be scared to show your flair and take them on. Mm. You know, get out there, get the footy. You you tuck it on your arm. You just take them on. Mm. Doesn't matter if you get caught from time to time. Yeah, just be who you are. Yeah, make those mistakes and learn from them. Yep, brilliant. So your son's an up and coming football star, and I'm just I mean I'm curious in this because you. I mentor to so many and you, you take people under your wing and obviously your son now has the potential to be drafted and he's moving up that up that stream. First of all, I guess this question is coming more from a 
young giving advice to the young people mm. coming through. What is some of that advice that you're giving to your son as he's, <laughs> as he's working his way up the ranks? Yeah, un yeah unfortunately for Tex, who turned that in this year and it was his draft year, so he went to Melbourne to board at Xavier yeah. College last year and didn't play any footy whatsoever. So that was a big miss. Uh, year of, of development for him and his junior days he played some really good footy but then he sort of um, yeah was keen to get over to Melbourne and, and, and start training hard and, and getting stuck into it um, and then couldn't play mm. and then the following year which was this year um, he had a, a, a small uh, stress fracture in his foot yeah. that he, he missed six months of yeah, the right. beginning of this year and he came back and he played two games mm. one was a practice game the second one was a school grand final between Xavier and Scotch mm -hmm. and he played well got in the best players in his first game in two years but then COVID hit the following week so the recruiters didn't get a chance to see him um, develop say over uh, he needed that next six seven weeks and I think there was yeah, six or seven games left that he needed all those games to see for uh, recruiters to see that he he it could improve Absolutely. and to show what he's got, but he didn't get a chance to do that. So unfortunately, you know, he didn't get nominated for either Port or Essendon, um, but he's got an opportunity to, to train with Essendon over the summer to to get rookie uh, listed. listed. So that's what he's fighting for at the moment. Um, he starts next Monday. And is, is there any <clears throat> um, is there any reason in why the strategy to move in? To Melbourne as opposed to stay here in Adelaide? Yeah, yeah well, he was uh, – my first preference was, you know, for him to stay here yeah. and to board uh, at one of the schools here, which he was already at, but an opportunity came, a scholarship okay. came up. Yeah. So, well, I could not, not – At Xavier. Xavier yeah, which I, mean, I could not knock back. one of the top schools in yeah. Australia. And it was yeah. um, uh, a full boarding scholarship, yeah. which I felt would be good for his um, development, yeah. to, to be away from home, to – be independent and to grow um, and he's had a ball. He's yeah. made some really oh, good cool. networks over there. But, yeah, he's an aspiring football and he's hungry. So, um, yeah, I look forward to him seeing how he goes over the summer. And I just encourage him to be a hard worker and to be really um, technical on, on your gym work uh, and, and all the, all the um, yeah, technique when it comes to playing footy or in yeah. the gym. Get your technique right and just be really fussy with all your technique and mm. your eating and everything, that'll yeah. help you build good foundations. And have fun. Have yeah. fun and be hungry. Be very hungry and don't like get beaten. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he knows that and and aim high. So, um, yeah, good luck to the young yeah. fella and I look forward to seeing how he goes over the summer. And, he, and and if he doesn't get picked up over the over the summer, and but there could be a good chance because he's, he's still growing and developing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he'll just pay in the nab next year because um, he's missed two years of footy. So, yeah. He's two years behind the current gra uh, draft yeah, group. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Two years behind. So he only needs to get a year in the in the NAB League next year and play really well and he'll get drafted next year. So yeah. just don't, don't stress, son. Like, mate, it would be good to get a year under you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You're only 18. Yeah. And build for, for next year's draft and have fun hey, in the NAB League. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck to him. Yeah. Just looking back at your career, is there anything other than not speaking up at the – playing no. more, playing more <laughs> other, nah. Is there anything that you wouldn't have done or you'd like to revisit and do it? You know what? No, I've got no regrets. Yeah, that's good. I, I, and I'm lucky yeah. from that uh, respect um, to have a successful career. And But you have to work hard for it. I mean, yeah, yeah. you've got to work hard on your injuries, your mindset. Uh, when you've got the injuries to come back to do the rehab, there are form – if there's form issues, you've got to nip them in the bud because you don't want media talking about you and you, you're expected as a high-profile player to, to be playing well. So, you know, it's there's pressure there. Hmm. But – I, I guess that's something you got to deal with in life, it, 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 and 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 not allow the pressure to get to you as well. I mean, but what actually drove me was the fear of failure. To be honest with you, yeah, yeah, I was scared to fail. Mm. That's what drove me. Fail as in well, not just not be known or not, not no, not not, win not to play well, so just not play well. Yeah, not to win premiership, not to play well. Like yeah. if I I didn't want to have two bad games in a row. That mm. my issue was my one of my mottos was. If you had a quiet week one week, mm. you're killing it the next week. Yeah. Never two bad games in a row. Yeah. Never. Mm. That was my motto. Did you – did that cause a sense of anxiety then? Like, did, <laughs> I think there was – but it was always – it was it was level. It, yeah. was, it was always um, – yeah, there was a little bit of anxiety there because you had to really focus and draw from deep and, and concentrate. And that was a lot of mental energy. Yeah. So you were exhausted after the games. And, did um, you ever read the papers or anything? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you read. Yeah, you'd read yeah. them. Yeah, because there's some players that just say I don't, 
I don't read it. Yeah. It comes from the papers in this summer. Well, I didn't mind reading them because there's a lot of good things in there. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of your photos, if I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was it like coming out into into the real world after your career? You, yeah, you yeah. hung up the boots and, and, and moved on. What, how did you handle that transition? Yeah, the transition was really tough. And yeah. it still is in a way because I, I did footy, you know, since the age of five and mm. – was a professional for you know 16 17 years so to be in that bubble and to be in that environment you wish you could do it forever mm. it's it's just a, just a different buzz to play in front of you know 50 70 80 100,000 people when I was playing with this and then yeah. in the Anzac Day games the adrenaline you'll never ever get that ever again mm. and that's something that I miss mm. and the camaraderie playing in that group but also being able to that competitive juices that I have on the football field I miss being competitive and physical and me- messing you know um, mixing it with other good players yeah, to release it to beat them. Yeah. <laughs> I love beating them. <laughs> you never ever get that back, and yeah. that's something that's a hole that will be there forever. And then, so you transition out the real world where you're trying to focus either on business or you, or you work for someone, yeah. and you've got to keep earning money because you've got a family. Yeah. Um, and I'm dabbling in a few different businesses, like you mentioned. Yeah. I'm sure you mentioned in a sec. Um, so yeah, it can play. Uh, um, Play in your mind a bit. You, it's, it's known that when AFL football is finished, or a, a long-term sporting person, or it might be a long-term per, a person who's been in a career for twenty-five years, and that's yeah. all they know, and they're going to try something new. Same yeah. thing. Yeah, you just sort of institutionalised in something else, and that's that's tough, mm. and that's something I always deal with. And so I crave to be successful at other things, and I'm going to yeah. keep driving. Is there any reason why you didn't hang around the football world? Is in going to coaching or? Just wasn't your thing. Uh, Seventy hour weeks. Yeah. And weekends. Yeah. And intense. Yeah. And I just want to relax and I just want to watch the football and enjoy yeah. it. Um So you had your time and now Yeah, just, I'm happy to just watch it as yeah. a fan now yeah, on the okay. weekends. Um, but I don't want to be around um, you know, doing long hours. <laughs> it's and it just and traveling again, you yeah. know. Um yeah, just want to okay. watch it from the outside. Um yeah. Is that how you got into the art? Was that one of the ways of your release? Yeah, the art, exactly. Um, the art has been unbelievable for me. It's mm. given me an opportunity. And I, it just started with a, a, a competition between the Indigenous boys back at Port Adelaide. Mm. Um, we said, let's see you can do the best painting out of us Indigenous boys and we'll get the rest of the team to pick the best painting. <laughs> yeah, great. And we'll deem you know, whoever, whatever the boys pick. That's yeah. the best artist out of all us Indigenous boys. Yeah. So I went away and took it seriously and started it. Yeah, wow. I didn't finish it though, no. and this is my last year of footy. And I don't think the other boys even started. They say they did. Yeah. Like Peter Burgoyne, uh, was Sean there? Yeah, Sean was there, and yeah. I don't think they started. No, but I started it and rolled it up and put it away. Ten years later, my wife Pippa found this unfinished canvas, and she said, "Can you? Oh, who did this?" I said, "Yeah, I did it." Oh, that's pretty cool. Can you finish it? So I finished it, and it sort of just grew from there. And I got a little bit of a taste for it, and then I created my own style. Um, yeah. But it's been good because it spiritually connect me with my Aboriginality yeah. and to learn more about yeah, my, no my mob. And when I paint, it's a, I, uh, I see it as a view from above looking down through and I'll paint about the night sky and yeah. the stars and, and, oh, the, and the dreaming and you start dreaming. Um, but it's a view down to my mum's country, which is the West Coast always. Yeah. And I'm a professional artist now. Who would have yeah. thought, you know, yeah. from, uh, from a professional footballer, um, into a professional art career, um, it's it's been so good because it's filled a hole to a certain respect, a yeah. big hole, and it's given me a purpose and 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 something to do that I enjoy doing, and it gives me that sense of fulfilment. Yeah. So I'm blessed to have had that. Without the art, yeah, probably would be in a bit more of a um, different sort of mindset or yeah. more of a negative. Well, it's almost a meditation. Yeah, type it, it's it's sort of healed me yeah. and kept me with a purpose. And yeah. I think if you don't have a purpose, yeah. You can get lost, and then bad habits can start, and you start thinking negatively. You know, more negative, and when you, and we know how bad negative thoughts yeah. are. You know, and I think we all have them. I have them, and yeah. I still, from time to time. But I think my arts helped me, and I've learned to push negative thoughts aside. Mm. If they come in, don't dwell on the negative. You push them out. Yeah. I push them out straight away because yeah. I only want to focus on positive stuff. That's it. Yeah. So art's been great for me. Yeah. Um, Did you have to go through the? The experience of learning all the different all, types of all, arts. All and, self-taught, yeah, but I read like, books yeah. and I looked at paintings, yeah. but I created my own style. Okay. Creative, organic style. Yeah, yeah. That's been the the key, that I've yeah. got my own style. And then you, 
then you know your mum's um, land so well, so you've just yep. kind of adapted that into it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Created a sort of contemporary edge uh, to yeah, my art. Like, oh, I love your art. Oh, it's thanks. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to see if we can get one hung up on the wall in here, but claim it on tax being in the office. We'll see how we go. Um, is there uh, with the with the entrepreneurship? You've obviously looking out. So the art is one thing, and it's doing really well. And I think actually last time we spoke, you said you can't even take any more orders. That's how yeah, many you've, you've, yeah. Got, you've got going on. Well, I can, I can take orders, but it's a bit of a waiting list. Is probably. Yeah, eight week, three month waiting list. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I've got about I've got seven commissions I've got to do. Okay. So I'm going to be it'll be a busy summer. I'm going yeah. to chip away over the summer and yeah, um, combine. Is there it. an element? Is there is there the potential for doing too much that you then lose the passion of it? No, because when I finish every painting oh, at yeah. the end, or as I get near to the end, and I get it and I look at it, I get a buzz. Yeah, I still get that warm fuzzy feeling. Yeah, okay. when I look at the painting. And I go, yes. You've made something there. So You've I don't think I could something. ever lose the buzz, mm. ever. Yeah, I mean, you never right. say never, but well, yeah. I've been painting for about five years now and, um, you know, I'm probably doing about 50 paintings, 30 to 40 paintings a year. Yeah, wow. Um, which is not a lot, by the way. <laughs> no, but yeah. it's… So, but because, you know, it takes me a week to two weeks, you know, it, yeah. it takes a long time. Yeah, yeah. Just get that buzz when it's finished. It's like, or maybe it's the sense of accomplishment. I don't know what it is. Um, it's just that spiritual. I don't know. It's I, it's really hard to explain, but the buzz is still there. Yeah, I well, think it will, make, I think it will always be there. Well, now you're making some good coin out of it. Too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> no, but I mean, it just all yeah, adds I mean, to I've the. I mean, I provide for my family too. <laughs> yeah, but exactly right. It's just a bonus. That's the bonus. We got to eat. <laughs> but the art, I'd, I'd, I'd keep doing. I'd have if if, if I wasn't paying, getting it paid a, a single cent, red cent, or yeah, a dollar for the paintings. I'd have them on my wall at home because yeah. I love them so much, yeah. and they make the house look so good. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> so you're now in the throes of, sort of the next steps of your career, yeah. and you know you've got a few things going yeah. on. Um, recruitment yeah. company, your uh, you know full stream recruitment companies yeah. underway. I saw Paulie Vandenberg posting about Posted it the other one day of the positions that I've won. Yeah. yeah, so in that entrepreneurial uh, phase. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to just do art f- it whilst it is full time. Yeah. But I, f- I squeeze hours in on the weekends. Like I get up early on a Saturday or Sunday and put two or three hours in. Yeah. Uh, and a couple of hours at night. So I like yeah. to paint a lot on the weekends yeah. and a bit drips and drabs during the week. Yeah. But yeah, I just had a conversation with a friend of mine who's been in recruitment for many years. Um, and, and we've been chatting on and off about, you know, recruitment. He goes, Gavin, he said to me once, so Gav, look, mate, do you know in the corporate space, there's hardly any representation uh, in white collar roles for Indigenous people. Yeah. I go, oh, I said, come to think of it, I know, yeah. I know. He said, do you want to do something about it? I said, yes, you should create your own recruitment company. Yeah. And with the narrative to change um, uh, that narrative in regards yeah. to um, not having enough Aboriginal people in corporate roles. Yeah. So I said, let's do it. Yeah. So. But it's grown from there. You've gone mainstream, yep. and you've yeah, well, so, the, well, yeah, yeah. So that that's our overall um, key pillar, or yeah. our, our purpose, yeah. And that will be driving us absolutely. But we're a mainstream recruitment company, so Murra Partners, yeah, Murra Partners. Um, you know, we're recruitment, uh, a white collar recruitment corporate search firm, and Brilliant. we have the ability to recruit for any company, for any role, white collar role, corporate role. Um, but we're mainstream, so we're not like. Um, only recruiting Indigenous people into corporate roles yeah. because at the moment we don't have enough of our mob yeah. ready. We we got some really up and comers who we want to nurture yeah. and get them ready to go into these sorts of roles. But we don't want to put them in roles when they're not ready mm. and set them up for failure. That's the worst thing. It's like one step forward, ten steps back. Yeah. So this is a long term approach because it's it's been like this here for so long. So that's something I'm really passionate about as well to change yeah. that narrative and. And be a successful recruitment company, you know, a, a mainstream recruitment company. Mm. Is there – we spoke about it. I'm not 100% sure if this is in place yet, so it's an off-the-cuff question. Is there a niche that you have in regards to every single person that you do recruit for? Yeah, okay. So, and definitely. So, when we are recruiting, you know, roles, um, you know, mainstream roles yeah. for, for anyone, yeah. um, we want to make sure that when we put up candidates, mm-hmm. they'll go into uh, – 
a position culturally aware. Great. And uh, we'll put them through some cultural training. Perfect. Um, to make sure that their company, you know, won't be at risk of, you know, someone saying the wrong thing and not yeah. understanding culture, you know. And that, that goes not, not in just Indigenous culture, it's all cultures, but being respectful and uh, also, um, you know, respecting women, mm. for instance, mm. you know, um, and all these other, you know, um, equality uh, things yeah. that we, we need to make sure people are, are having them before we handle them onto a, a company. I love it. Do you believe that your success in sport contributes to your success in both your art and business? Do you, is in like the yeah. mindset, the dedication, I think so. the determination? I think you, you get that drive that you want to be successful in football and you um, – and you want it to continue in other areas of your life. Um, and now I'm starting to, you know, put that into place. It's, mm. It takes me a little while, I mean, you know. I'm in my mid-40s now, so mm. – and I finish, you know, footy at 34. Mm. So it's taken me 10 years to really find – so it just goes to show you, you, it, it can take you a little bit, a bit of time. Of growth in there, yeah. Growth time to, to be ready to start mm. creating opportunities – um, that are going to be sustainable rather than just jumping into something that you're not ready for. Well, it sounds like you've got a really amazing strategy with Murrah Partners and what you guys are doing there. Your arts, Re- doing yeah, I'm really stuff. excited with that because you know I I, I plug in and, and work closely with um, another recruitment company you know, called EGM, mm-hmm. and they're very successful. You know, really successful um, recruitment company and mm. work side by side with them on a, on a lot of projects also. So yeah, I think yeah, it's partnerships really important as well. Yeah. And working together as a team, I agree. because you can't do it all on your own. No. If you want to do a great job, you've got to have the right team, where people play the right role, their role. Absolutely, and that's when the true success will come. I think. I'm, I am conscious of your time, so we'll, uh, one last question before we deep dive into our quick fire questions. <laughs> so, uh, this is a question that I kind of ponder and I, I speak to it a, a lot within the podcast. Is how do we and I'm just getting to get your intake on this. How do we pursue our visions and realize our visions of where we want to be as both in human and as a human and in sport or in business or whatever it might might be, whilst at the same time trying to maintain our family relationships and <laughs> the balance and, and the balance. Yeah, oh. yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think that's a question that. A lot of people have to uh, think about mm. quite regularly before it can sort of get out of hand. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, the, like the question comes from you're doing so much and you've got six kids. Yeah. And like, you're managing a lot in your life and coming from a career of, of you know, th- a high profile position and all the above. Yeah. I think I spoke just previously about the team. I yeah. think you put a, a team in place yeah. that plays their role. Yeah. And I have my role to play, but I don't want my role to be. Um, overwhelmingly time consuming that's mm. going to take away from my family time. Mm. I think the most important thing is your time. You can never ever get your time back. Yeah. Ever. That's the one thing that we can control is our time. And then you have to weigh up, I think, is your time, uh, how precious is your time? Is money more important to you than your time? Because you've got to get a balance. Because if it is, because money is not going to make you happy. Mm. Time is going to, what's going to make you happy yeah, with, and the relationships in your life, whether it be with, with your close family, your extended family, your friends, close friends, your extended friends and balancing what relationships are important to you and where you spend your time mm. is the key because that's what's going to make you happy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Oh, hardly. Yeah. Do you place more emphasis on one or the other? Do you say, actually, I'll... Family will always come first, or do you do you try to find that balance and do both? Our oh, families always, yeah, families always first. I think you can find the right balance where your family comes first. I mm. think you can always get the balance right, yeah. But family always has to come first in yeah. that that balance. The grand scheme, one hundred percent. I mean, like my wife and I, most mornings we get a coffee together. Oh, great! But and it does come back down to yeah, I guess you know you the type of job that you're in as well. I mean, mm. whether you can actually work different hours and mm. the roles that I'm in, I can, I, I'm flexible with my hours and how yeah. I work. But, but you know, for some people, I, I guess I can understand that it's their roles are time-consuming, but is that really 
sustainable mm. long term. Like, no, is it? it's not. It's, it's, I don't say. I don't reckon it <laughs> I is. I don't believe it is. No, I don't think it is because it's going to affect relationships and yeah, yeah it's it's yeah. You, you you hear a lot of stories sadly mm. where people just you know are committed to their work and they lose so many other things in the meantime like friends, family, mm. and I've seen it before and the relationship with your family and friends are really important but yeah balance is the key in finding that right balance excellent thank you for that it's always a, a deep question <laughs> the quick fire questions now to round off the podcast we are big readers here big learners <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily need to be a book but what is something that you're reading or learning from right now <laughs> you hit me on the spot there and I knew this question was coming and I, I, I do want to say to you don't ask it because yeah. I don't have the right answer but I'll just be honest because I'm an honest sort of guy. Yeah. I just keep yeah. it real. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm known for I keeping it real. wouldn't expect anything. Not way. reading anything particular at the moment. <laughs> That's good. But the, 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 the paper and uh, articles and stories yeah. and, you know, sports and yeah, yeah. You know, in the paper I, I like to have a bit of a read, yes. Yeah. But you said you're getting into audio books as well recently. Yeah, my you, wife yeah. has encouraged me to yeah. get into the audio books, but I think that's up my alley and that's what I'm going to be having a crack at over yeah. the summer, definitely. I'm an audio book freak. Um, I uh, any opportunity I get, I've got the headphones in the ears listening to something. I'm going to I'm I'm going to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Is there what's one oh, sorry, what's one lesson that's taking you the longest to learn? <laughs> One lesson. Uh, my wife says, yeah, probably cleaning up after myself <laughs> more consistently. Yes, that would definitely. Especially when right. we get a, you know, four girls at home, young girls. Yeah. And, you know, she's. Pull your weight. Pull my weight at home. Yeah. With, um, yeah. And I'm trying. I am. I really am. And <laughs> I think it, and I think it should be 50-50 yeah. at home. I'm a big believer. And I just need to practice what I believe. <laughs> it's, uh, I struggle and, with And it I'm well. trying. <laughs> it's more about priorities, right? I think I have this argument it's, with my with my wife all the time. Is Well, the, the cleaning for me isn't a priority. It's uh, spending time with the children to be more of a priority. <laughs> That's my excuse anyway. <laughs> uh, but I think I, I need to put a better system in place so we're more consistent in that system, which mm. will help help my beautiful wife at home because she does so much. Very good. Um if you could have three people over for a dinner, who would they be? Uh, I, I know the first one would be Michael Jordan. Oh, yes. And the second one would be LeBron James because then I can hear them <laughs> talk about who's the greatest. <laughs> Brilliant. I'd like to hear that conversation, yeah, new person. Throw in, um, and the third one, um, I'll throw, throw in Dennis Rodman. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I'd like to hear a lot of his stories. Yeah, he'd have some pretty wicked stories. If, back if in the you day. want a, if you want an audio book to start off with, Here's, yeah, get onto that. Okay, it's I will. A, I will. Yeah, I will. You're in for a wild ride. And I said the basketballs because I've been watching a bit of basketball lately. Yeah, and the Michael John, uh, Michael Jordan doco. So yeah, that, that's why those yeah, that's three, the three came day. to my mind. The Last Dance documentary was fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah, unreal. Mm. I'm a big fan of uh, Roger Federer as well. Just his class and well, talent. talent. If you you know just to the question of how do we balance, if there's a there's a human being that I reckon's got it pretty good, mm. he's uh, found a way to spend. He travels with his family, and, <laughs> and he's one of the best in the world, <laughs> right? So, uh, if you, um, well, what's one? Of, what's some of the best advice that you've ever received? That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not one for for holding on to specific, um, you know, quotes or sayings yeah. or advice. You know, I, I just think head down, bum up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always hard work, and I think I've learned it myself or watched others. You, you, the overriding theme is about being particular with, you know, in sport the way you you train, mm. and being fussy with your technique. Mm. Um, so I think that's vital whether it be in the gym I said before or yeah. on the training track so running technique weightlifting technique you know lunging yeah. all, all that is, is vital and building your muscles to make mm. them strong so you can run all the Ks so it's the technical side but then always have flair mm. be creative mm. and don't hold back and don't be scared to be creative on the football field so they're, they're, they're the 
Doesn't or in to, life, it doesn't need to just be. And in life, yeah. so true. And yeah. that's right. Yeah, well, yeah. Be creative in yeah. life, and don't ever hold back, and don't ever die wondering. Yeah. Have a crack. It's amazing because you have taken that. You look at the art. He's a perfect. Well, I'm having a crack. Yeah, yeah. and being creative. Creative. <laughs> Uh, you know the, the coffee. I'm yeah. having a crack at coffee yeah, well, that's as well. True too. Yeah, so business. I'm having a crack. I'm being trying to be creative. So you don't want to die wondering. If you had access to a time machine, where would you go? Would you go forward or back? Oh, that's a tough question. Do you really want to know what's forward? I probably don't really want to know. No, I do. Do I'm you? A, I'm a forward person. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like just with you know be cool climate change and all that sort of stuff yeah, well, worries me a bit. But no, that's been a bit negative now, isn't it? Well, it depends. I, I if I'm watched, just being real. Have you ever watched Back to the Future? The movie, yes. Back to the Future, where he goes to the future and he gets the almanac. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a betting man, why wouldn't you <laughs> get the almanac? Bring yeah. it back. Well, you can figure out what's going on. And then bring it back and bring those ideas. Well, and true. Take it. <laughs> true. No, that's forward thinking. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I don't know, mate. No. I, I can't answer that one. No. I just think, I don't know. I'd like to go back early days and, you know, and I'd like to go forward. I don't know. Yeah. No worries. If you had one superhero power, what would you choose? To be able to fly. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. I better fly. Or uh, you said one. Oh, the other one was invisible. Yeah. yeah. Invisibility can be a bit creepy, though. I mean, well, true, actually, no, just fly. <laughs> I want a better fly. <laughs> Didn't think about that. That's right. Yeah, so fly because you can just fly over to the York Peninsula or fly and fly fast too. Yeah. Just well, like when you bring Superman. when you bring it back to your bird's eye view that you run, you do with your painting, right? <laughs> you know, see the flying would give you a great, great view. Yeah. yeah, the view, always the, the view. view eh? It'd be amazing. Now you're a dad of six kids. Do you have a dad joke? Anyone that comes to mind? Uh, I don't, no, I don't have dad jokes. I'm no. not a big joke. Like I, I like hearing good jokes, <laughs> but I never remember the jokes. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. I of can people never are. remember them. <laughs> I've just never been a rememberer yeah. type guy of jokes. But I love hearing them. Yeah. But with the kids, I like sort of scaring them. It's like, oh yeah. Whee! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they go, oh, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they try and do it to me. And then I've just given this really loud laugh, like if you're laughing about things, so I have the loudest dad laugh. So it's more of a, you know, those dad yeah, yeah. laughs and they love it yeah. that I'm getting into so the laugh. So you're more of a dad idiot as opposed to a dad joker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Give, do something silly and yeah. laugh really loud with them and then give them a cuddle. Yeah. No, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Look, thank you so much for your time today. It's been amazing having you on, hearing your journey, hearing your thoughts about your journey and your leadership. You've obviously done some amazing things and and – and it's a testament to all the hard work that you've put in. So appreciate all that you're doing as well with your art and, and, and the Indigenous world and trying to promote that and really get the, you know, the white the corporate world more involved in that space. It's definitely something you should hang your hat on. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me, mate. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks, guys. Take Thank care. You. Cheers, oh, actually, guys. sorry. Where can we find you? So Mara, Mara Partners. Yeah, Mara, where, yeah, Mara Partners, just web, web website. Website. Yeah. And then and, connect on LinkedIn uh, and, and follow LinkedIn. on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn. Beautiful. Yeah. Easy done. Thanks, guys. Cheers.